He received his PhD in sociology from the State University of New York, Stony Brook. His areas of interest in terms of his research and teaching include social movements, theory, the sociology of W.E.B. Du Bois, the civil rights movement, race, religion, social inequality, and political sociology. His articles on these topics have been published in multiple journals, um, including the British Journal of Sociology, Social Problems, and the Sociology of Race and Ethnicity, among uh, many other journals. He's also published in other journals and edited volumes and edited volumes on topics such as social movements, protests, and W.E.B. Du Bois. His most recent book, The Scholar Denied, W.E.B. Du Bois and the Birth of Modern Sociology, it was published in 2015 by the University of California Press, and that book has won numerous awards, including but not limited to the American Sociological Association Oliver Cromwell Cox Book Award and the Prose Award for Excellence in Social Sciences. In addition to these book awards, Morris has received multiple other honors and awards for his lifetime of scholarship and service. Um, to name just a couple of his most recent awards, he received the John D. McCarthy Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Scholarship of Social Movements and Collective Behavior, as well as the Award for Outstanding Leadership in Social Activism, Community Organizing, and Scholarly Teaching from the book Brooklyn, New York City Council. And so we are so excited to have uh, Dr. Morris here with us today to speak to our Oglethorpe community. The timing of this lecture is excellent as we have just moved to add Du Bois to the list of required reading in the Core 200 level. Um, so please help me in welcoming Dr. Alden Morris. Thank you uh, so much. It is a real pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, I'm certainly uh, excited about the fact that you all have put uh, Du Bois into the curriculum. Uh, I'll have a little bit more to say about that later. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Professor Sarah Ter Terry uh, for uh, her role in inviting me to come. And I also certainly want to thank the faculty and the students uh, who are here uh, being a virtual audience uh, uh, to hear this lecture. So I've never been to Oglethorpe University before. It was not on my radar, but now it certainly is. And it's a, it's a, it's a real uh, pleasure. I guess I should say that uh, Atlanta itself uh, is one of my uh, favorite cities and whenever I can travel, especially after the COVID uh, has lifted, uh, I will certainly get by your fine university just to uh, check it out. So now I, I do again want to uh, really thank the uh, students uh, for, uh, for coming out and to uh, be a part of this uh, event. So then drawing on my uh, recent book, The Scholar Denied, my uh, address highlights the multiple roles of W.B. Du Bois uh, that he played as a scholar, as a founder of scientific sociology, and as a major activist of the 20th century. And so then to be sure there are crucial lessons that scholars and activists can learn from Du Bois's long and distinguished career as we confront, um, as you know, very difficult crisis in America right now and uh, in the world. Du Bois began his groundbreaking scholarship and activism in the last decade of the 19th century and continued until his death in 1963 on the eve of the great march on Washington. Um, he actually uh, died on the eve of that march when uh, Dr. King uh, delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech. So then there is an intriguing well-kept secret regarding the founding of American scientific sociology. A black professor located in a small, economically poor black university founded the first school of American scientific sociology. In particular, the black sociologist and activist W.E.B. Du Bois developed the first scientific school of sociology at Atlanta University, not far from your university 
as you know, as you probably know, it was Atlanta University back at the turn of the 20th century, but now it is uh, Clark Atlanta University. So then my purpose in writing the Scholar Denied was to shift our understanding of the founding over a hundred years ago of one of the social sciences in America. Current accounts claim white male scholars at prestigious white universities were the exclusive founders of American scientific sociology. In these accounts, black social scientists and black universities were not even marginal contributors to the, to the development of scientific sociology. And those accounts fail to acknowledge, even mention to this day, the foundational role that Du Bois and his Atlanta school played in pioneering scientific sociology. I argue that indeed, if Du Bois's innovative ideas and methodologies were at the center of sociology a century ago, they would have provided powerful theoretical and methodological directions for this new social science. The denial of Du Bois's scholarship impoverished sociology. And since I know that there are people in the audience who are not uh, in sociology, but they may be from other disciplines, but the ignoring of Du Bois's scholarship actually impoverished sociology, the other social sciences, as well as the humanity. So then by situating Du Bois at the center of sociology, I challenge existing paradigms, disrupt dominant, dominant narratives and illuminate new truths. Moreover, I highlight the importance of sociology as an emancipatory science. And by emancipatory science, I mean that sociology at its best generates activism and social change. So although we view the social sciences as long-standing institutions, they really rose just a decade before the 20th century. The first sociology department was founded at the University of Chicago in 1892. In 1895, Chicago sociologists founded the major journal of sociology called the American Journal of Sociology. And then just 10 years later, the first, first National Association of Sociology and you know what it was called? It was called the American Sociological Society. So think about that, American Sociological Society. Think about the acronym. So uh, sociologists was, uh, uh, of course, embarrassed to have a, 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 uh, an organization that, uh, that people would refer to as ASS. So therefore, the American sociology uh, changed the name. It is now the American Sociological Association. However, early American sociologists were not uh, very scientific. Let me put it this way. Early American sociology itself was not very scientific. Pioneering sociologists did not develop empirical methodologies and they failed to collect data to support their scholarship. So when we think of sociology today, uh, I imagine some of you, some of the students there uh, are taking um, sociology classes. And what you will learn is that when we talk about sociology and its, its, its data and so forth, we have in mind studies where surveys are administered, interviews conducted, field work undertaken, and quantitative and qualitative data are utilized to document and to interpret the human condition. Contemporary sociologists are expected to test, to test theories with empirical data and to make that data available to other scholars so they can reach their own independent conclusions. Yet this did not happen in early American sociology. It was essentially social philosophy because it relied on what we call arm the armchair theorizing or what Du Bois referred to as car window sociology signifying casual observations obtained through the window of a fast moving train. So then car window sociology, unlike what you all are learning today was not rigorous because it relied on hunches and on rumors and travelogues and loosely formed opinions. This sociology had another feature. 
this may come as no surprise to many of you, but early American sociology was racist. When sociology emerged, American racism was rampant. Jim Crow emerged as the new regime of racism, which really constituted slavery by another name. Lynching in uh, Atlanta and all across the South was so commonplace that it led the great singer Billie Holiday to sing Southern trees bear strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the root, black bodies swinging in the Southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the popular trees, end quote. So then right here in uh, Georgia and across the South, Blacks were stripped of the boat, starved economically, and treated as subhuman with no rights that whites were bound to respect. So then you see it was a small wonder that the ex-slave sang, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. So then this ugly racism presented America with a fundamental challenge. How could a democracy declaring, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, justify the oppression of millions of black folk. But then white America solved this paradox. They transferred the ideology of white supremacy governing slavery to the new Jim Crow regime. And that ideology claimed that blacks were an inferior race, actually, more akin to chimpanzees than human beings. By the early 20th century, scientific thinking had gained momentum and prompted a thorny question. Was it possible that a rigorous science of race would disprove the black inferiority thesis? So white scholars from the natural sciences to the humanities, to biology, to literature, and history to sociology reached a solid consensus proclaiming that science itself proved that black people were inferior. Thus in the 20th century, white science and white supremacist ideology walked together, justifying racial oppression. Now, I wanna speak especially to the students uh, when I make this point is that today, it is easy to, under, to underestimate the power of the belief in black inferiority. For whites, it constituted a belief in a God-given racial superiority or, ordained by heaven. For blacks, racial inferiority meant enduring brute oppression coupled with treacherous psychological turmoil. Moreover, when blacks internalize inferiority, they fail to organize mass movements to overthrow an, an oppression which appeared to be divine. But then again, a sure-footed challenge of scientific racism, racism was soon to be launched. In the last decade of the 19th century, W.B. Du Bois had become a confident, brilliant, young black intellectual, convinced that God did not make his people inferior. Indeed, Du Bois's confidence was on full display when he mused about the significance of, of him being the first black person to receive a PhD from Harvard. When they asked him about it, Du Bois replied, the honor, I assure you, was Harvard's. So then in an age where whites view blacks as inferior, Du Bois' own achievements were jarringly inconsistent with the myth of black inferiority. So then let me just run through some of his achievements. At age 20, Du Bois earned a bachelor's degree from Fisk University. By age 22, he earned a second bachelor's from Harvard University. At age 23, he earned a master's degree from Harvard. By age 25, Du Bois had completed two years of advanced graduate studies at the University of Berlin. And at 27, he became the first African-American to earn the PhD from Harvard. His dissertation, doctoral dissertation, was titled Suppression of the uh, African Slave Trade, 
and it was published in the Harvard's 1896 96 in the Orgworld volume of historical studies. So then what is my point? It is that Du Bois was one of the most educated persons in the world when whites viewed blacks as inferior. Indeed, his genius, advanced education and supreme self-confidence prepared Du Bois to become the scholar fully capable of attacking the lie, the lie of black inferiority. However, Du Bois faced a great challenge. How was he to engineer the overthrow of scientific racism? That is a science claiming that whites were superior and blacks inferior. Du, du Bois's scholarly preparation proved critical. He discovered that accepted sociological knowledge was shot through with racial biases. So then discussing this situation, Du Bois wrote that most unfortunate is the fact that so much of the work done on the Negro question is notoriously uncritical. Uncritical from a lack of discrimination in the selection and weighing of evidence. Uncritical in choosing the proper point of view from which to study these problems. And finally, uncritical from the distinct bias in the minds of so many writers. Thus, Du Bois sought a new scientific sociology that unearthed the real causes of racial inequality. That is, what, what are the real causes behind racial inequality? How do we explain the fact that whites are on the top and blacks are, are at the bottom of the racial hierarchy? So then Du Bois's mission was clear. He wanted to interject science into sociology by conducting concrete studies among actual people, his people, an oppressed race who lived and died behind the veil of racism. Du Bois believed that a truly scientific study would demonstrate that oppression caused racial inequality rather than, than black DNA, something about black people. He declared that the world was thinking wrong about race because it did not know. The ultimate evil was stupidity. The race problem was in my mind, a matter of systematic investigation and intelligent understanding. So then Du Bois enumerated the fatal errors, errors of white social scientists. First, their reasoning was not informed by history. Second, they failed to use quantitative data to measure social phenomena. Third, they failed to acquaint themselves intimately with people by actually observing their daily lives and by interviewing them to grasp their reality. Or they did not conduct empirical studies on the population they analyzed. And fifth, and, and possibly worst of all, they advanced racist beliefs as sociological truths. In sharp contrast, Du Bois's sociology embraced the scientific method. His analysis were always anchored in a historical framework because he argued that to understand people, you must situate them within their historical context. At the University of Berlin, Du Bois mastered quantitative and ethnographic methodologies by conducting empirical research. Now then, after completing his training in Germany, Du Bois explained that he dropped back into nigger-hating America to conduct empirical studies of African-Americans, boldly confronting scientific racism. His research agenda departed radically from white social scientists whose race theories emerged full, fully blown from their minds rather than from research. Thus Du Bois challenged white car, white, uh, car window sociology. For example, he scolded the prominent Cornell University economist, Walter Wilcox, Walter Wilcox informing him this is what he said to Wilcox, this famous economist at Cornell. He says, the fundamental difficulty in your position is that you are trying to show an evaluation of the Negro problem only from inside your office. It can never be done. If you must go on writing on this problem, why not study it? Not from a car window but get down here, and by that he meant get down here in the South, get down here in Atlanta and really study this problem firsthand. 
In contrast, Du Bois often resided in those communities that he studied, literally interviewing and surveying thousands of people. Now, this is something that was not being done by social scientists in this era. This is the turn of the 20th century that he literally interviewed and surveyed thousands of people. And thus, Du Bois developed an emancipatory scientific sociology that proved valuable to liberation movements, including the civil rights movement. Du Bois's sociology theorized that more de modernity, that is the, more, the modern world, of the African slavery, centuries of slavery and colonialism. These oppressive systems generated exploitable labor forces and raw materials, enabling, enabling European and American elites to build capitalist empires. So then I suspect that in your uh, sociology classes there at Oglethorpe, is that you read uh, Emil Durkheim and Max Weber and his predecessor, Karl Marx. They were analysts of modernity. However, it was Du Bois alone that theorized the relationship among racism, colonialism, slavery, Western empire building and capitalist development. So then Du Bois is making the argument that if you want to understand the modern world, then you have to understand racism, you have to understand colonialism, you have to understand slavery, you have to understand the empires that Western capitalists uh, in Europe uh, uh, actually developed capitalism. So then Du Bois interrogated the, the global color line and its production of world, worldwide race stratification. So then if you learn anything about Du Bois or you read anything about Du Bois, you probably will see his most famous line. That is the line where he predicted, quote, the problem of the 20th century is the color line. And he went on to argue that that color line structured the relations of the darker to the, night, the lighter races of men in Asia and Africa, in the Americas and the islands of the sea. So therefore, to understand the modern world, you must understand its racial dynamics. And if you study the modern world, you must bring those racial dynamics into the central core of your analysis. Now, Du Bois also formulated a theory of the self. You know, how do we, how do we come to have identity? His concept of double consciousness analyzed how the self itself emerges as a product constructed through social interactions and communications. I mean, the argument here is that the self is not something you are born with, but it develops in the process of social interaction. Now, Du Bois's formulation went well beyond uh, Herbert Cooley and George Mead because it highly, highlighted, again, racial dynamics and power relations and talking about how those power relations shaped our identity. Now, in uh, works including Black Reconstruction, uh, Du Bois, uh, and, and, an, and an article called The Damnation of Women, Du Bois analyzed class, race, and gender interactions, thus anticipating the intersectionality and critical race paradigms. So then, once again, Du Bois is arguing that to understand the modern world, one has to look at the relationship between social class, between race and between gender and how those particular uh, social formations actually interact. So then Du Bois was the first sociologist to, to theorize that people's social positions shape their lived experience. His analysis proceeded from the perspective of the oppressed. His sociology of Black people uh, pose a fundamental question. This is what he asked. How does it feel to be a problem? From this perspective, Du Bois identified the, source, the sources of cultural creativity and organizational strength that enabled African-Americans to produce movements that liberated themselves. Du Bois's emancipatory sociology of African-Americans demonstrated, and I'm going to going to show in terms of his analysis of Black people. This is what he found, that African-Americans 
were equal to all races because racial oppression and not biological traits relegated blacks to the bottom of the racial hierarchy. Next, that there is no such thing as black crime. I'm sure that you all uh, continue to hear about the high crime rate in the black community. And we associated uh, black crime with, with blackness. But Du Bois argues that there's no such thing as black crime because social conditions and not racial traits produce crime. It also showed that the black community usually portrayed as a homogeneous mass was actually heterogeneous, consisting of various social classes and diverse experiences. He showed that the black church was a central cultural and organizational institution of the black community. So then long before the civil rights movement, Du Bois predicted that such a movement would arise based in the black church. He said that, quote, someday the awakening will come when the pent up vigor of 10 million souls shall sweep irresistibly toward the gold out of the valley of the shadow of death, where all that makes life worth living, liberty, justice, and right is marked for white people only. So then what is going on here is that none of the white sociologists had any idea on the eve of the civil rights movement that it was coming. Indeed, white social scientists thought that it was impossible for black people to organize and sustain a movement like the civil rights movement. They believed this because they believed that only whites had the power to bring about basic social change. Thus, Du Bois emerged as the first sociologist to articulate the agency of the oppressed. Moreover, he moved easily from the standpoint of the oppressed to that of the oppressor. He wrote this about the oppressor. He says, high in the tower where I sit, I know many souls that toss and whirl and pass, but none intrigue me more than the souls of white folks. Of them, I'm singularly clairvoyant. I see in and through them. I view them from unusual points of vantage. I see these souls undressed and from the back and the side. So what Du Bois is arguing here is that he, his sociology is, is able for, to, to, to allow him to understand white people better than they understand themselves. And uh, it allows him to understand white people better than other people, including black people. Thus, Du Bois created a scientifically rigorous and emancipatory sociology. Two decades before the Chicago School conducted empirical studies, Du Bois's Atlanta School executed numerous empirical studies. So then what I'm arguing here is that what is called the Chicago School receives all the credit for founding urban sociology in the 1920s. But Du Bois wrote a book called The Philadelphia in, uh, Negro in 1899 that actually pioneered urban sociology. To be sure, Du Bois pioneered both rural and urban sociology. Moreover, he was surely among the first American social scientists to develop what we call structural analysis of so social inequality, emphasizing interlocking systems of domination. So the bottom line is that white sociology, despite the sociology that Du Bois produced and pioneered, white sociologists ignored Du Bois's pioneering scholarship. In fact, Chicago sociologists of the 1920s promoted themselves as the founders of empirical sociology and race studies. But what I have found in my research is that there is one incontrovertible fact. Du Bois emerged as the first number crunching, surveying, interviewing, and participant observing and field working sociologists in America. 
Now, Du, du Bois did not create this new scientific sociology alone. Many unforgotten scholars who work right there in Atlanta with Du Bois have been uh, erased from sociological memory. So then let me just give you a few examples of some of the uh, sociologists who were founding members of the Atlanta School. Monroe, Monroe Work, who earned this lad man. Monroe Work, who earned a master's degree in sociology from the University of Chicago in 1903. And who became the first African-American to publish in the American Journal of Sociology in 1900. So Monroe Work became a prolific member of Du Bois's research team. He published numerous important sociological studies. Next, Richard R. Wright Jr., the first African-American to earn a doctorate in sociology at the University of Pennsylvania in 1911 also participated in Du Bois's research projects, came to Atlanta and worked with him in establishing the first scientific school of sociology. Then there was Edmund Haynes, the first African-American to earn a doctorate in sociology at Columbia, Columbia University in 1912. Haynes co-founded the National Urban League and he became a key member of Du Bois's team and published numerous sociological studies. So then the scholarship produced by the Atlanta School was distinguished by their use of empirical methods and their analysis of migration and, and urban communities. I would like to uh, just say very quickly to you that the students who went to HBCUs, Atlanta University, Tuskegee, uh, Hampton University, Howard University, these students were recruited by Du Bois to participate in his research projects. And so here you have all of these students who after they got their degree, they went out into these communities and did a lot of the surveying and the interviewing for uh, the Atlanta School. And so it's very important for us to realize that these black students at uh, HBCUs uh, did uh, uh, really monumental scientific work to help establish the uh, Atlanta School in the early 20th century. Now, a month before Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, he acknowledged Du Bois's enormous contributions to sociology and to Black protests. Now, King grasped the importance of sociological analysis for freedom struggles because Guess what? He earned a bachelor's in sociology at Morehouse, right there in Atlanta. Uh, and then his closest advisor, who was Ralph Abernathy, he earned a master's in sociology at Atlanta University. Therefore, King was acutely aware of how the devastating effects of in internalized inferiority affected the Black freedom, freedom struggle. King argued that people who were oppressed, Black people of, a, of, a, of oppression, that these people often failed to develop the new attitude, the new mental responses that the situation demand. And he was talking about so many Black people who did not join into the civil rights movement because they had internalized inferiority, racial inferiority. And King said this about them, that they end up sleeping through a revolution. King explained that Du Bois's sociology minim minimized the effects of Black people's inferiority complex because, quote, one idea that Du Bois insistently taught was that Black people had been kept in, a, in oppression and deprivation by a poisonous fog of lies. The twisted logic ran, if, if, if Black people were inferior, they were not oppressed. Their, their place in society was appropriate to their meager talent and intellect. So then Dr. Du Bois recognized that the keystone in the arch of oppression was the myth of inferiority and he dedicated his brilliant, brilliant talents to demolish it. That is King speaking about the importance of Du Bois and overturning 
the black and the black inferiority that, that black people internalize. So then Dr. King revealed that Du Bois's 1935 masterpiece, it's called Black Reconstruction. I urge all of you to read it, uncovered crucial historical black agency. This is what King said about that book. The truth, the truths he revealed are not yet the property of all Americans, but they have been recorded and they arm us. So King is saying that Du Bois's scholarship armed him and the people in the civil rights movement to engage in struggle. So that King pointed out that long before sociology was a science, Du Bois was pioneering in the field of social study of Negro life that was very empowering. And thus Du Bois demonstrated that scholarship combined with activism could produce social change. And then, so while most scholars remain clustered in the ivory tower, fearing political involvement cont contaminates scholarship, Du Bois demonstrated that, th that this belief was pure nonsense because for him, the purpose of rigorous science was to produce knowledge useful for, for social change. So what am I saying? Du Bois' position is, is that you don't go to school just to learn theories, to conduct studies, and to publish them, but you do that for the purpose of engaging in struggle to make the world a more just world to live in. So then as a result, Du Bois together with other activists developed the blueprint that made the modern civil rights movement possible. So then as King, as Du Bois, as Du Bois research and wrote, he marched on to the battlefield, organizing and leading important movements for justice. So Du Bois was not simply an, an ivory tower scholar. And this is what King said about him. History had taught Du Bois, it is not enough for people to be angry. The supreme task is to, is to organize and unite people so that their anger becomes a transforming force. So what, 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 what Du Bois would say today is that it is not enough for people to be angry about what is going on in the United States, about the level of police brutality, about uh, how white supremacy is being declared from high places, including the White House. He would say that it is not enough to be angry, that you must organize, you must unite people so that their anger becomes a transforming vote force. And so in this respect, of course, he would say that it is important to get out on November the 3rd and to vote to try to make America a more democratic society. So King talking about how uh, Du Bois uh, operated as a scholar, he said it was never possible to know where the scholar Du Bois ended and the organizer Du Bois began. The two qualities in him were a single unified force. Now, let me just talk about briefly here, uh, contemporary movements, which would encompass Black Lives Matter. So Du Bois' scholarship and activism are relevant for, for contemporary movements, including Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is a decentralized movement organized to protest police br brutality and to seek racial and social equality. Now, I'm speaking to uh, students. And so what I want you to know as students is that mostly young people fuel Black Lives Matter, young people especially students, usually propel movements. Indeed, most successful movements utilize young Black people. I, I'm sorry, they utilize young people. You can look at movements in South Africa, all across the globe, in Europe and other parts of the world, you will see that students and especially young people are the primary sources of energy and creativity. Now, maybe you have not thought about this, but most successful movements utilize young people 
because of their flexible schedules. You know how you might have classes Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or maybe Tuesdays and Thursdays. And so they, so students are free. They have more discretionary time than adults to engage in protests and social change activities. Also, students are relatively more economic independent than are adults. Also, young people have more energy. I can remember when I was young, I certainly have more energy than what I have now. Also, young people are more likely to be idealistic and to be innovative in their thinking. And these are the reasons why young people are central to, cho to social change movements and bringing about change. Then not surprisingly, young people play crucial roles in movements of Du Bois's day. Now, what I wanna ask is this, given that there were social movements in Du Bois's day and that young people played important roles in them, how did Du Bois respond to young black protesters? Did he advise students to embrace the politics of respectability and only pursue upward mobility? Or did he advise students to initiate protests and to attack injustice head on? So then Du Bois's response to student protests in the 1920s at Fisk University where he graduated provided shining, provides shining examples of how scholars can support protests. Back then, Fisk's white president, Fisk had a white president and he perpetuated Jim Crow racism on campus. Because students endured this oppression, they broke rank at Fisk and they rebelled. Students did not, Du Bois did not hesitate and his support of the young protesters. And I quote, this is what Du Bois says. And here again, we are always actually or, potential, or potentially saying hush to children and students. We're putting on the soft pedal. We're teaching them subterfuge and compromise. We are leading them around to back doors for fear that they shall express themselves. And yet, whenever, and wherever we do this, we are wrong. Absolutely and eternally, and eternally wrong. Unless we are willing to train our students and young people to be cowards, to run like dogs when they are kicked, to whine and lick the hand that slaps them. We've got to teach them self-realization and self-expression, in quote. Now, during that time, Black leaders rebuked protests because they feared that basketfuls of white dollars flowing into Fisk would dry up. But Du Bois thundered, dignity and self-expression were far more precious than white money. When Du Bois learned of additional protests, he embraced what we would call the politics of disruption. Quote, again, for a second time, and with no advice, no instigation from without, the students rioted and struck. They pounded ash cans. They sang. They yelled. And they broke windows. I thank God that they did. I thank God that the younger generation of Black students have the guts to yell and fight when they are insulted and mocked and oppressed. The spontaneous rebellion of young and hurt souls who refused to submit to calculated and remorseless tyranny is a splendid and a heartening thing. So then what, what does this really mean? It means that Du Bois, the Harvard man, renowned author, organizer of African people worldwide, and the leader of, a, of the NAACP stood and solidarity with protesting students yelling and breaking windows. Moreover, Du Bois encouraged radicalism for change because he saw the protesters as the real radical, the man and the woman who hit power in high places, while power backed by unlimited wealth 
hits it and hits it openly in between the eyes. Nevertheless, Du Bois tells us that these black students at Fist, they talk face to face and not down at the big gate, at the big gate. So then he responded to these young people. He said, God, speed the breeze. Now let me uh, rush on to my conclusion. So then what must colleges and universities do to advance critical scholarship and activism in the Du Boisian tradition? First, I would argue, it is time to banish the myth that a group of white male sociologists at the University of Chicago founded American scientific sociology. Instead, the Du Boisian Atlanta School of Critical Sociology should be recognized as the founder of modern scientific sociology. Moreover, Du Bois's Du Boisian oriented critical scholarship should be infused throughout the curriculum here at Oglethorpe and worldwide. That's why in the beginning I said I was so pleased to hear that Du Bois is being brought into the curriculum there at your university. To have a vibrant and relevant university, it is critical that people of color and the poor from across the world are recruited into our universities. You see, it is important to have all of these people, these young people, these students from different backgrounds, from backgrounds of poverty, from backgrounds of racism, from backgrounds of oppression, to have all of these students in the classroom with privileged students so that when they are at the table talking, what that means is that all ideas are debated at the table. You see, because true knowledge is generated when you have a clash of ideas coming from many different directions, from white people, from black people, from poor people, from oppressed people. And so then it is in the interest of students and faculty at all of our universities to promote the recruitment of diverse student bodies. It is only through this process can students then become informed and world citizens. Moreover, it is time to reject false dichotomies, positioning scholarship and activism as opposites. By so doing, we can reestablish that the social sciences can be emancipatory fields excelling in scientific, scientific scholarship that unleashes truths empowering agents of social change. Finally, in these troubling times, these very troubling times, we should recommit ourselves to developing an emancipatory social science and emancipatory humanities, really an emancipatory physical and natural sciences that finds that it is important to engender social transformation, social change. Then in Dr. King's words that because of the fierce urgency of now, an emancipatory sociology embraces Ella Baker's marching orders. You all probably have heard of Ella Baker. She was a great leader of the civil rights movement right there in Atlanta. She was uh, one of the founders of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And too often in our studies, we neglect the role that women have played in bringing about change and organizing movements to bring about change. This is what Ella Baker said. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, um, Dr. Morris, for that presentation. We have some time remaining for um, Q&A. Sure. So um, 
I guess we have two ways to do this. I'm trying to think what would be the, the best way. People can um, put their questions in the chat if you feel more comfortable with that, or um, you can hit, I guess, the, what do you think, uh, Dr. Terry, the raise hand icon and I can call on people? Yeah, I think if you use the blue raise hand icon, it stays up so that we can actually see you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so let's do it that way. So if you have a, because I can't see everyone at one. So if, if you have a question, for Dr. Morris, if you could just hit the raise hand icon or put the question in the chat. Uh, Anna? Anna, did you have your hand up? She's muted. Oh, she's muted. Sorry, hold on, hold on, that's my fault. Um, there you go. You should be able to unmute now. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, um, so I was wondering, one of the Du Bois pieces that I've uh, like revisited a couple times this year is um, his essay, Why I Won't Vote. And yes. I was wondering um, how you think that essay like fits into like his larger larger body of work in terms of sociology? Uh, yes, uh, that's an excellent question. And she's referring to uh, Du Bois uh, article, I believe it was in the 40s. Um, that was coming up, there was a, an election coming up. And Du Bois had worked for social change all of his life and uh, had been persecuted for doing so. And he observed that whether Democrats were in power or whether Republicans were in power, that no fundamental change happened. And so he argued that both parties um, did not promote any fundamental change. And that for him, that at that point in his life, he had gotten to the point where he just did, could not in good conscience vote for either the Democrats or the Republicans. And so that was the idea of why I cannot vote, or why I will not vote. Now, what I would say to that position is that that was only one time, and Du Bois, du Bois lived to be 95 years old. That was only one time that his frustration uh, with the um, politics of both parties turned him off, and he uh, decided that he would not vote. But I think that if Du Bois was alive today, and given the choices that exist, given the nature of what is going on, where will America go? Will it uh, increase uh, as a strong democracy or will it undermine democracy? And I think that Du Bois would see a clear cut choice. And I think that he would champion uh, uh, voting but I also want to say to you is that I understand why young people uh, may very well feel, why should I vote for the Democrats? They don't seem to really bring about any change. Black people remain oppressed. Uh, why should I vote for Trump and so on and so forth? So, um, I, I, so I think that they, I can understand the question that they raise. What I would say, again, channeling what I think Du Bois would say on this question of to vote or not to vote, I think he would say, well, who's in office will determine all of the judges, the new judges that are brought to the bench, the, the, the bench not just in, um, in the Supreme Court, which you know, I'm sure I haven't heard the news because I've been preparing for this lecture, but I'm pretty sure that, that, that we have a new conservative Supreme Court justice by now. Uh, but there are literally hundreds of conservative justices that Trump has appointed. Many of them are young white men who will be here on the bench for another 30 years and so forth. And so it's especially important for young people to understand that what is going on now uh, will determine what society will look like, this, the kind of society that they will live in. 
but yes, I think that what that what that article shows is that that Du Bois had some of the same concerns that many of us have today, and that is, um, to what degree does it matter about who's in the Senate, who's in the House, who's in the who's on the Supreme Court, who's in in the White House? Um, but I think that one of the things that we know, and I'll just in that in it with this is that for social change movements to be uh, successful, the people who participate in them, the people who organize in them must have hope. Movements are born of hope, not despair. And so there are some administrations that are voted in that generate far more hope than others. And with that kind of hope, then you can uh, uh, build and sustain our movements. Thank you, I really appreciate it. That's a very good answer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have another question in the chat from Dr. Nardo. He was wondering if you could tell us a little something about the two women who were in the photo that you showed of the Du Bois Atlanta School. <laughs> I always get that question. Um, one, one was, uh, can you go back to that, that slide? Um, uh, one was uh, Mary White Overton. Mary White Overton um, was a founder with Du Bois of the NAACP. Uh, they uh, worked together and she um, was she, she was also a scholar. She wrote a book uh, on uh, Black people uh, being only uh, uh, half people because of, uh, right here, right here. Yeah, so that's, that's Mary, so Mary White Overton. And um, she uh, did a lot of scholarship. She worked uh, with Du Bois and they were partners in organizing movements for social change. And that's why I include her as a, as a vibrant member of the, um, the Atlanta School. Let me see her. Okay, Lucy Laney. Lucy Laney uh, was out of Georgia uh, she spent a lot of time um, in the Atlanta area working uh, with Du Bois in, the, in, his, in, in his school of uh, sociology. Uh, but she was also a major educator. She founded schools all over. Uh, and she believed, in, like Du Bois, she believed that Black people had to be educated in the liberal arts um, to become leaders and to bring about change. And so she broke from the philosophy of accommodation by Booker T. Washington, just as did uh, Du Bois. Uh, but once again, um, one of the reasons that I uh, wanted to highlight Lucy Laney and Mary White Overton is to show that once again, that women were making major uh, contributions uh, to uh, social change movements during this period as well as to scholarship uh, during this period. And there are, there are of course, many others. I, you know, I talked to you about the, the, the students at the HBCUs that went out and did research for Du Bois. Well, many of those young students were, were women. And so then I just wanted to show that uh, the Atlanta school was made up of diverse uh, men and women and students who did research and participate in activism to bring about change, that is to overthrow Jim Crow. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Um, do we have other questions? Uh, Will? Hello. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this. This has been great. Um, and so my question is, because it, it stands out to me um, how the treatment of Du Bois for so many years has shown that sociology, even though 
it studies things like racism and social structure is not immune to the to those same social structures and to its social context and to racism. And so I was wondering, first of all, um, what do you think the implications are of that for studying sociology and for conducting research in sociology? And second, how far do you think sociology has come in addressing that racial bias or not come in addressing it? Yes, uh, again, a very uh, excellent question. I think what it, what it shows is that uh, science is a social institution. Science is not something that is above society. It is embedded in the society. The scientists themselves are members of society. And so then they, the scientists themselves, they bring in all of the biases uh, of their uh, society. They bring in racism. They brought in and bring in um, uh, gender uh, oppression, all of those, those kinds of ideas. And so I think it's very important therefore to, to realize that science then is a social institution and like any social institution, it has to be scrutinized, it has to be studied. And, um, and so uh, once we understand that science is a social institution, then we can ask the question, then what are the biases rooted in social science in any particular era? So now, given that you all are in Atlanta, the, uh, what you should know is that although the Chicago school, you know, here in Chicago is considered like the first scientific school of sociology, but a great deal of pioneering sociology came out of the South. The first two major books written on uh, sociology were written by two uh, white Southerners to justify slavery and to justify the idea that whites were superior and black people inferior. And so then, yes, so sociology then was, was, was born in, during racist times and it, and it, and it definitely, um, it definitely uh, reflected that racism. Now, I should add that there were always some people, uh, some scientists who questioned the orthodoxy of the day and so forth, but it is amazing to the degree, the degree in the early 20th century, how white scholars, no matter what their discipline, they believed in uh, black in white superiority and black inferiority. And they they and they you know advocated these kinds of ideas in their science and so forth. Now, what do I think? Do I think that we made real progress in, in terms of, in, of in, in, you know, in terms of Du Bois in particular? The answer is definitely yes. I think that we've made real progress in sociology, uh, in the other social sciences. Du Bois was always studied more in the humanities than in the, in, than in the social sciences. It's very interesting. Du Bois was declared himself to be a sociologist. And yet he was marginalized, excluded, erased for over a century. Now, um, what, what I would say is that there is much uh, movement on the foot right now to incorporate uh, Du Bois into the curriculum of social science across uh, universities in the United States. Uh, my book on uh, Du Bois, uh, The Scholar Denied, uh, has helped a lot to generate this movement to decolonize the curriculum and to bring Du Bois in to our studies. And what I would also say is that many young scholars working, you know, who are, who are in grad school, who are getting PhDs and so forth, 
they are uh, studying Du Bois at a clip that was that never existed before. And the reason is because most, for most students, their professors discouraged them from studying Du Bois. Some even said to the to students, well, why are, you, why are you wasting your time studying Du Bois? He, after all, he was not a sociologist. Or they said that you will not be able to um, get a job if, you, if, if your dissertation is on Du Bois and so forth. Now that is breaking down. Now that we, many of us are showing that Du Bois was, was a fundamental thinker and founder of scientific sociology, is that the discipline is changing to have to accept this new fact. I mean, we have proven that that was the case. And so I, I would, I, I, I'm hopeful. Uh, I'm not uh, totally optimistic because some people, some scholars would just add Du Bois in as a kind of affirmative action move. But what we're talking about is that no, Du Bois is as important as Marx and Weber and Durkheim and all of the modern great scholars like Irving Goffman and others that we study, Robert Park and others that we study. So it's not an, an, a move for an affirmative action kind of uh, uh, act. This is to uh, uh, situate Du Bois in the foundations of the dis discipline, the canons, and so that we can really go and study his work. Um, I should say to you, uh, finally, that Du Bois was so prolific. We have only begun to study his work only at the surface. Let me give you an example. Between the ages of 15 and 95, Du Bois published something on average every 12th day of his life. And so if you can just try to wrap your mind around that, because he was also a journalist, a political scientist, a historian, a philosopher, uh, a novelist, a journalist, and so on. And so then what we hope to see in the future is that Du Bois will become a, a, a central part of the curriculum. And, and, and that is necessary because in these troubling times, there is so much yet for us to learn in Du Bois's work that can help us uh, deal with the future and the present in a much more informed and critical way. Dr. Morris, do you have time for a couple more questions? Sure. Okay, thank you. So there's a related one in the chat um, from Dr. Herschler. He said, as you're just up the, up the lake from the University of Chicago, how much success have you had in having them revise their narrative of sociology's American genealogy? I often get that question and I love it. Um, before the book came out, I was going around, I was invited to many schools to give talks uh, on uh, the ideas in the book. And so when I was uh, <clears throat> invited to give a talk at Chicago, in the Department of Sociology at Chicago, I was like, oh my God, you know, I'm going to get attacked. I better be ready. And so I went and I read, uh, the works of most of the many of you know some of the works of many of the sociologists there. I thought about which ones were most likely to take issue with my thesis and so on and so forth. And so I went I went in to that talk all geared up for a big fight. It never came. Uh, what happened was that many of the scholars there uh, said that uh, Professor Morris, uh, you know, we really welcome um, this corrective to the uh, discipline. And to my uh, surprise and delight, uh, some of them gave me ideas about how I could make my argument even stronger. Now, um, I think that, uh, you know, there has been some pushback. Um, I gave a uh, talk at the American Sociological Association uh, shortly after the book came out. And there was a white senior scholar in the audience. And uh, he jumped up and he said, your book, your book is full of lies. And he said, um, he said, you know, 
you, the thing is, you black people don't really know when, when white folks are doing something good for you. And he was angry because I critiqued uh, the role of Robert Park, uh, who gets the credit for creating uh, the study of race in the United States and, and not Du Bois. It got very heated. And he was not open to any real dialogue. He just wanted to, to proclaim uh, that the book was packed with lies and so on. And so the audience, it was a jam packed audience in the room. So they started to get agitated. And they said to him, we really think it's probably about time for you to leave. And uh, with that, I, he looked around and he saw the agitation in the room. And then we, uh, we didn't see him much uh, longer after that, he made his grand escape. But on the serious side, no, but that was serious too, that happened. But uh, I think that, um, oh, I know what I forgot to tell you. So uh, last spring, a group of scholars at the University of Chicago organized a, uh, a conference on uh, the Chicago School and the Atlanta School. And they had me as the keynote speaker and they uh, really promoted uh, the Scholar Denied, the, the book that I, I, that I had written. And so what I would say, you know, when you think about it, um, the people that I talk about and I critique uh, of the Chicago school, but it's not just the, the Chicago school, it was the Columbia school, it was the Pennsylvania school, it was the, the school at Princeton, at Yale, they, they were all very, very similar uh, in erasing Du Bois and pushing scientific uh, racism. But at any rate, we had this conference at Chicago, it was well attended and uh, went, went well. So what I, what I would say to you is that uh, I think that uh, the future is, is bright. By the way, um, I was recently elected president of the American Sociological Association. And, and once again, I mean, I think that that election is another response that suggests that, that scholars are, are open now to looking at many scholars who have been denied, who have been erased. Um, there's a book by Joe Deegan, G Joe Deegan on how women sociologists like Jane Addams and others have been erased as well. But there are other scholars from around the world like Franz Fanon, CLR James and others uh, who have been erased. And so I think that there's a movement then around the world called decolonizing the curriculum. And so I think that, um, that, that especially with many young scholars uh, uh, coming into the academy and so forth, I think we're going to see some uh, pretty rapid changes and decolonization of the curriculum. So I have reasons to be optimistic. All right, Dr. Morris, this is the final question. Uh, so this question is in the chat. It says, what do you believe is the active solution today to the discreditation and racism that is so casually baked in the system and society? What do I think are the solutions? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I completely agree that racism and uh, racial inequality are deeply embedded into American society. All of the colorblind rhetoric uh, certainly uh, is just incorrect. This is not a colorblind society. It never has been. And I think that we saw this with uh, COVID-19 uh, when we saw the disproportionate number of black and brown people dying from COVID. And it was just clear that that wasn't random, but that was because they were disproportionately poor. They, had, uh, they did not have the same access to quality health care. The health disparities along racial lines and class lines was just really, really very severe. Um, I, and, and we can see the police brutality. You know, one of the things is, is that modern technology is playing a big role in revealing the, the, the nature of police brutality and, and racism. What happened to George Floyd is not unique by no means, we, we're seeing that. But thank God for that camera. 
that captured it in real time. There could be no denying of what uh, happened there. And then many other, many, many other places we see black people shot in the back and so on and so forth. Um, so, so on the one hand then, it is crystal clear that racism and poverty, class oppression, these are qualities that are deeply embedded in the fabric of American society. And if we are to be true, I think, to our calling, we must address those. We must try uh, to uh, eradicate those. Now, am I hopeful? To some extent, I am hopeful. So my first book was on the civil rights movement called Origins of the Civil Rights Movement. So, I, so I'm a student of the civil rights movement. I've studied the civil rights movement. And one of the things about the civil rights movement is that the people who participated in it, who risked their lives, who went to jail and all, they were largely black people. There were always a few courageous white people who participated in the civil rights movement, like the, 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 the two civil rights workers, young college students who were killed in Philadelphia, Mississippi during the Mississippi Freedom Summer. And there was others, Viola Liuzzo and many, many others. But, oh, but, but, overall, but overall, the civil rights movement was a movement of black people. But what do we see today? we see something fundamentally different. And I think it's a real shift, a real important shift. That is large numbers of white people, especially young people, of Asian people, of Latinx, from all backgrounds, all class backgrounds are participating in movements today to bring about change, unheard of. And so I think that um, I uh, always pay close attention to what young people are doing because they, as I argued, they really are the motor of change. They're the motor of social trans transformation. And so when I see all these young people from all different backgrounds, I see uh, different engines of change out there fighting to try to make make America the society that they claim to be on paper, you know, hundreds of years ago. And so then I, um, I'm, I'm hoping and I'm optimistic that with the challenges that are going on now, with all of the movements and so forth, with the reckoning, the racial uh, rec reckoning in America, that we will see fundamental change. But I will just end on this note. It will not happen automatically. What we see is that generally when you have social changements, progressive social change uh, movements, then you get the backlash. And you get forces, counter movements that try to take us back. And that's a lot of that is the, is the, is, was the whole tr Trump, uh, I don't well know what I wanna call it a revolution, but certainly a reaction to Obama and to other uh, progressive um, elements was, is, a, is a white backlash. And so it is possible that uh, this, this moment of change uh, will not last, will not be able to sustain itself, and will go into a period of backlash. That is very possible. But, the, but what that means is, is that the possibility of change is in the hands of the people now who recognize the serious inequalities and who will stay mobilized, who will stay organized and fight for change. And so then I'm optimistic, I guess I should say cautiously optimistic. Okay, well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Morris, for your presentation and for spending the time to talk with our students and faculty and answer their questions. So um, thank you again so much for your time.